to the Republic for which you stand, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Bob, would you? Yes, sorry. Yes. Thank you for this day. Forgive the sunshine for allowing us to participate in civil and soul citizenship. And she was those that made Sylvia Blue. She was those that give us strength and safety in this nation. And most of all, in this great human world. Amen. All right. So today is the safety night. And Roger, do you have any specific uh, topics you'd like to address before I go into <coughs> weather-related presentation? Yeah, sure. you, you're welcome to do it. <laughs> okay, sounds good. You'll take a break from your duties. Um, I'll do my best to make it interesting. Um, I didn't create this presentation myself. A uh, quick disclaimer and gratitude to the person who actually uh, shared it with me. A uh, gentleman from NTSB, uh, he was a presenter at one of the um, seminars. Um, so he was uh, very um, happy to share it because uh, it's his passion. He is uh, and um, he, he believes um, weather-related incidents are a huge part of overall uh, GA uh, accidents and incidents, which in DSB is uh, regularly uh, attending to. Um, so the name of uh, center uh, is Donald Ake. Um, Ake, uh, actually, he's senior meteorologist uh, in the Office of Aviation Safety, and he is uh, participating in um, uh, incident investigations. So let me share my screen. So first of all, I'll figure it out if it works for Teams. Okay, I, we can see it on TV. Let me share it on Teams. Okay, uh, all attendees on Teams, can you see it and can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, do you think we can shut down the AC unit? Um, hopefully it's cool enough no. from the main air conditioner uh, for us to actually stay here and not... not, not. Right, so <clears throat> according to um, NTSB, uh, well, everybody's familiar with NTSB, so I probably will not uh, go into details of what they are uh, doing, but it's a government agency which is independent uh, from FAA, uh, right? So uh, they are responsible for investigating transportation-related uh, uh, accidents and incidents. Trains, um, ship, um, aircraft, uh, anything, I believe, moving and uh, happening to cause an incident or accident, uh, will be investigated by National Transportation Safety Board. Uh, so in this presentation, we'll review some of the Part 91 general um, aviation accident statistics, identify main weather threat areas, review several weather-related accidents uh, specific to adverse winds, VFR into IMC, uh, inadvertent encounter with thunderstorms or uh, similar uh, phenomena, and we will uh, speak a little bit more about what, besides thunderstorms, may cause uh, trouble for aviation. Uh, focus on the importance of pre-flight weather briefing and use of weather in cockpit, what kind of tools we have today at our disposal, and uh, hopefully get into making weather-wise decisions. <coughs> uh, when we are planning our flight, when we are in flight, let's say it's a long cross-country and we need to really adjust our plans uh, because the weather is developing faster than we anticipated. Uh, so, a quick note uh, on NTSB mission, right? So, it's an independent federal agency charged by Congress with investigating every civil aviation accident in the United States and significant accidents in other modes of transportation. So, priority for them is aviation related, but they also investigate railroad, highway, marine, and pipelines. So what they are looking at when investigating uh, accidents, uh, they are looking at the person, a 
pilot or machinist or whomever is responsible for operating specific machinery. Actual machine, uh, technology used, uh, infrastructure and whatever, and environment. So they, they, they look at the complex picture uh, which led to the accident. So if we look at uh, this graph, we can see that over 10 years, uh, the statistics pretty much didn't change much, uh, significantly. They remain flat. So we see uh, some neglig neg negligible de decline uh, in accidents, but nothing uh, mind-blowing, right? So it means we are steady, uh, steadily improving the picture, but not significantly enough to, to, to reflect um, uh, on a graph. So especially if we look at the uh, overall number of accidents, we see a little bit of decline. But if we look at fatal accidents, it's flat. Not, not, not much of a change. <laughs> so a good point is that uh, general aviation um, industry overall still remains fairly safe if we compare ourselves to um, cars to, to most common mode of transportation we average over uh, 30,000 people uh, being killed in crashes every year in the end in that state flat as well over over time so what, what comprises uh, um, general aviation flight hours and accidents uh, by purpose of flight right so there are different type of uh, aviation sectors and we are looking um, at all total uh, GA flight hours versus GA accidents. So if we look at flight hours, so we can see that personal uh, flight time is prevailing, as well as number of accidents within the... Michael, would you please just a little bit quieter? Um, so personal uh, 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 GA flight contributes more significant uh, to overall uh, accidents in J sector. So this is another way to look at it. Uh, U.S. civil aviation accident rates over uh, nine, nine years. Um, and we can see that there is a bit of a decline uh, in, in, total, in total flight hours. And we can see a uh, breakdown in different types of flights. Uh, personal, general aviation, overall. Uh, GA instructional part 135 etc so this graph illustrates uh, top GA personal flying accident by categories um, so we see that the majority of accidents loss of control on the ground loss of loss of control in flight system component failure mostly related to power plant and abnormal runway contact which probably relates to loss of control on ground to, to, to most cases. So we see that even though the top three categories, right, uh, on the ground, uh, loss of control on, on the ground, loss of control in flight, and, and some kind of com uh, failure, what strikes me here personally is that out of these three categories, most contributing to fatal accidents is a loss of control in flight, right? So it's pretty clear that something is not right so it, it's not everything was fine with airplane but pilot lost control what happened and loss of control in flight is significantly dangerous the most dangerous event which may take place uh, when we are flying above the ground when we are encountering the power plant failure we, we are trained to anticipate that event so in most cases we if we fly the airplane uh, we deal with the situation, we, we, we follow the checklist, we can mitigate the situation. That's why it's not as fatal comparing to general loss of control in flight. Uh, NTSB, yes? Just to go to a comment, I didn't really notice anything about weather in here. Uh, we are getting there. We, we will drill down oh, okay. into specific issues why people lost, lost control in flight. And then on the bottom there you got into IMC, IMC. Oh. Well, that's that's general flight into IMC, not necessarily loss of control, right? So the person flies into IMC condition may not may maintain control through through, through the uh, s 
small portion of light, but may let's say run into terrain and, and whatever. Uh, so, so that the lot that the solar flies when they get that includes stalls or it includes stalls, steam, uh, those kind of incidents. When pilots stopped controlling their craft, stopped flying it for whatever I reason. I just what it said is stalls over. Well, yes. Uh, we, we, uh, this presentation actually drills into details on that. And TSB released a very detailed dashboard uh, where you can actually uh, spend significant amount of time analyzing uh, what caused, what is the root uh, of an ex accident um, by defining event. Uh, I will not go into details. I will share this presentation to, to everyone. You, you are welcome to uh, navigate to this um, page and check it in, in different sectors uh, what is most uh, important factor uh, affecting uh, the accident rates. So you can see accidents by calendar year, you can uh, break them down uh, by different phases of flight, by specific event, etc. They also break it down by factors like man, machine, environment, um, or not determined, for example. Um, and it, it's very detailed, very uh, powerful, and allows you to look at different um, scenarios from different angles. Uh, so again, it's a long presentation. I'm not going to spend much time on this particular uh, slides because you can experiment with it uh, at your leisure time. Now, uh, Donald drilled into specific uh, accidents where the contributing factor was uh, uh, weather related uh, over the period of uh, nine years. So total accidents, total events, non-weather related, weather related and the percentage of weather related is 23%. Not significant, right? But wh when you look at fatalities in this kind of incidents, you see that out of just 23% of incidents, 30% were fatal. So what does it mean? We need to look why pilots make this decision, what happened, what did they miss in planning their flight, and so on and so forth. So here uh, he broke down um, a specific uh, data known uh, for, for, for accidents and analyzed total uh, of almost 12,000 accidents. Uh, and as mentioned before, 23% or 2,700 were weather related. And then he broke it down into specific factors as it relates to the weather. So we can see that 53% of all weather-related accidents over the period of time were related to adverse winds. Uh, next, most uh, critical was low ceiling and poor visibility. Then we, we are looking at uh, events such as uh, nighttime flying, carburetor icing uh, events, etc. Only 2% contributed uh, from thunderstorms, uh, but 6% contributed by density altitude. So. It, it's, it's very interesting when we analyze the, the pure statistics and uh, what kind of uh, events led to specific accidents uh, based on, on data. Now he took all fatal ac accidents and analyzed them from those weather-related factors. The picture is much more dramatic, right? So we're looking at 43% of fatal accidents related to low ceilings and visibility, only 13% are ad adverse wind related, and we are looking at a dark night of 21%, so which to me is similar to low ceiling and visibility situation, especially if you can encounter like a black hole uh, um, illusion when pilot recently lost his life in Florida, departing into uh, ocean, uh, on moonless night and he lost uh, orientation and crashed into the, into the water. Uh, likewise, if you fly inadvertently into the cloud, similar situation, you start 
experiencing effects of uh, our body misjudging the, the situation and um, again losing control of aircraft. So we see that accidents in IMC account for 4% of the accidents total but account for over 40% of weather related fatalities. That, that, that was one of his biggest findings here. So he goes through definition of um, defining different events like lost control on ground and abnormal runway contact uh, which is number one cause of all weather related accidents so when we talk about adverse winds what what we are referring to wind gusts crosswinds tailwinds high wind in general variable winds and wind shift so when we experience uh, extreme crosswinds and we are not prepared for it we are not proficient flying in crosswind scenarios we may find ourselves in a wing strike uh, on landing for example um, or if uh, we are landing with a strong tailwind we may run out of runway we, we, we don't stop on time uh, one specific uh, uh, accident case study is um, this is a uh, identifier in NTSB database uh, that event took place in Cameron Park, California. Uh, the pilot was operating um, Bonanza A36 on August 30th, 2007 uh, during the daylight. So the pilot, uh, commercial instrument rated single multi land sea helicopter, he had it all. He was a CFI with over 2000 uh, total hours. Uh, flight, part 91 personal flight from Cameron Park to Ensenada, Mexico, just relatively short distance, uh, 425 nautical miles. No issues were identified with the machine. Environment, uh, it was, uh, airport elevation was at 1,287 uh, feet with a rising terrain, single runway, uh, VMC conditions, variable winds, density altitude, 4,125 feet. Significant, right? load a pilot plus three passengers bags and full of fuel he was over gross weight you probably have done it multiple times before uh, has not uh, run into a problem but he, he did not perform formal weight and balance at least there was no formal trace of documentation identified this is about 450 pounds of weight, I think. right so he needed 4,030 feet uh, to clear 50 foot obstacle. So what happened is uh, he had two unfavorable uh, scenarios coming together at the same time, unfavorable winds and high density altitude. If you remove one of these two, you may have actually survival event. But he departed uh, uh, runway 31, he experienced uh, wind shift into left quartering tailwind, he was over gross weight, high density altitude and rising terrain towards the departure. They didn't survive. Well, two passengers uh, in the rear fatally injured and um, pilot and pilot related passengers seriously injured. Uh, sorry, they did 50% survival rate here. Completely avoidable <coughs> event, right? So the probable cause, the airplane encounter with wind shift during takeoff that resulted in degraded performance and stall uh, condition. Contributing factor was over gross weight, high density altitude, and pilot's inability to compensate for the sudden wind shift. Um, he couldn't abort the departure on time. What are the psychological factors which contributed here? Well, it was supposed to be a nice flight to Mexico for the weekend. Um, some time pressure element maybe. Uh, get their 80s. Uh, they wanted to be um, in a place where they planned to go. Um, didn't work out. Well, that way, it's only 4,000 feet to take off with the tail, right? Yeah. And so he has a short wind. He's over gross by four hundred pounds. And then he goes from headwind or no wind to tailwind. 
he needs over 5,000 feet at that. Yes, real quick, but I can pull it up on the book at that. He would need 5,000, so I can already know what's taking place. So some complacency also contributed to this accident. Uh, the pilot felt he is extremely experienced, he knew his aircraft, he didn't bother to calculate the weight and balance, he eyeballed it probably, he it's thought, okay, okay my airplane can take it, variable winds, what a big deal. No, but big, it was a real big deal. So, what, what else can contribute? To, to accidents uh, in a different scenario. So thunderstorm winds may cause the wind shift, right? The, the front passage um, or developing thunderstorms, updrafts, downdrafts, it can significantly impact our ability to control aircraft, both on the ground and uh, in the flight. And it definitely impacts the performance of the aircraft in all phases of operation. Ground roll, Take off, landing, you name it. This accident, um, it's actually an incident, I believe. Um, yes, because nobody, it's a substantial damage to aircraft and minor injuries to the pilot. So, happened in Orlando, Florida. Uh, happened in the middle of the summer. We can, if we've been to Florida, we know what kind of weather they typically have. A lot of pop-up thunderstorms convective activity all over the place, people kind of used to that, right? So they fly in these conditions, so not a big deal. Well, sometimes it is. So the pilot is well qualified, CFI, single multi-engine, instrument rated, uh, 1600 total hours, and a student, so it was a practice flight. The AVFR conditions prevailed for uh, an hour of instructional flight, they successfully performed uh, some maneuvers after successful landing, taxiing to the ramp, wind abruptly increased with, in with intense rain. And CFI sends the wind shift and applied aileron elevator inputs. The aircraft violently weather waned, lifted and flipped over. And the aircraft substantially da damaged, pilot had minor in injuries. That's what it looked like. The probable cause, flight instructors failure to maintain control while taxiing in a strong gusty wind. How a pilot could have prevented that? Well, what was the weather? The METAR for uh, the airport is right there. When they departed, it looked great, right? So, okay, there is some gusty wind up to 18 knots, perfect visibility, scattered uh, clouds at uh, uh, 600, scattered at 800, and so on and so forth, looked good, but then when he landed, there was a change in the weather, there was a spacey uh, uh, report, which was much different from what he was ready for, so the, the wind changed direction, 28 gusting 47, we cannot control small aircraft with such a gust on the ground, pretty much impossible. Uh, visibility, thunderstorm, rain, clouds, and so on and so forth. So, the pilot wasn't really blamed for it, but he didn't plan his flight to the full extent. He could have prevented it from happening by simply not flying that day, because there was a clear big convective uh, activity developing in the area. So here we see the imagery showing the pulse thunderstorm rapidly developing and moving south southeasterly over the area at the time of the accident. This kind of activity can be analyzed based on forecasts and if we have slight chance of finding ourselves in such a pickle we should not fly. That's my take on it. Uh, but a little bit of complacency, okay, I know this weather, I have flown it multiple times, and I don't have to d dig deep into it, and if I see something is developing more or less dangerous, I will abort. Well, he did not have a chance to abort because it, it, the weather 
uh, degraded too fast. So this is what it looked like over the airport at the time of event. Pretty nasty. I was listening on the way here for, for the podcast, uh, I believe it's a more, more right rather uh, podcast, if I'm not mistaken. And the instructor uh, uh, who is teaching the weather was talking about the danger of convective activity, which does not even look like, look close like a thunderstorm. So on the radar, it would look like that blue, dark blue imagery, no red, no yellow even, but the, there are other clues which pilots may look into if such activity looks a lot like a cell of thunderstorm even if it doesn't grow into full feature thunderstorm it's a good idea to avoid it because the effect of that uh, uh, phenomena is that you may find yourself in a severe downdraft uh, situation uh, not expecting it you will find yourself in uh, significant wind shifts uh, in other uh, uh, related uh, situations and he talked about uh, an incident uh, happening in uh, middle states when pilot was, was flying north to south he did everything great in, in the planning phase uh, but did not uh, anticipate the act convective activity uh, and, and was flying IFR so he, he, met, he got into this undeveloped thunderstorms experience a severe downdraft at some point of flight he found himself inverted recovered 1700 above ground and diverted to the closest airport everybody was fine aircraft got a little bit of a damage unclear from what uh, phenomenon may be uh, severe turbulence or whatever uh, the left side of the w of, of windows were uh, cracked so he had to replace all the windows on one side he didn't know why it happened maybe the bending of airframe uh, who knows so yes in Orlando Florida possibly after they were on the taxiway if they had um, actually in directly into the wind maybe stopped shut down could have saved 47 gust <laughs> rapid change well, it, it, it beats being on the move and getting hit sideways he tried <laughs> he, he he did his best trying but uh, the wind simply flipped him over i don't think uh, 47 gust uh, is manageable for cessna one so yeah it's a pretty much a takeoff speed and, and he did take off <laughs> not so long Right, so be careful out there, right? So if we see something like this, do we fly into that? Probably not. If it looks mean and dangerous, avoid it as far as you can. And other advice that instructor on podcast gave um, to all the listeners, if you have to deviate from your course more than 10, 15 degrees, it's probably a good idea to change your route and go back and land someplace, wait it out, and do not, do not continue. Uh, otherwise, if you start debating 30 or more degrees, you find yourself in a pickle rapidly. And we'll see some examples for that. All right, so some of the common um, reasons for accidents and incidents uh, is VFR flight into IMC conditions. And a lot of accidents you, you can find on NTSB website where people started flying so-called scud running, trying to stay below the basis of the, of the clouds, uh, closer to terrain, and terrain may start rising, clouds get lower, and suddenly you have no options to go. On AOPA, um, there was podcast, there is a lot of stories like that. I highly recommend to every pilot to listen to those. Uh, there I was, and never again. <laughs> My favorite, absolutely. I listen to them all. As soon as they come come with a new one, I, I, I am listening to them. In pre-flight planning, um, in TSB study shows 41% of weather-related accidents, pilot did not obtain or received an adequate weather briefing. They missed few points. 
uh, why do we do that why pilots do do that from from time to time um i mean it we have so many tools at our disposal uh we, we should use them all and sometimes like in case of the florida pilot oh it's just a local flight we'll we'll go out for a couple of hours of pattern work we'll be back on the ground before the cell move, moves in or it develops a dangerous state it's a good idea especially if uh, weather is interesting and you look outside you see some puffy clouds building up uh, check out the outlook check out the forecast uh, see what's happening in the in the vicinity of your uh, airport uh, not necessarily just in the direct uh, uh, route of flight uh, be aware of your conditions uh, explore all weather products uh, review weather advisories um, get the formal briefing call, call um, 1-800 weather brief talk to the r real person he will give you some insight um, hopefully it will save your day yes I think they, they are saying iPhone is not a valid source when you simply look at your local weather or at the weather at the destination based on the iPhone app. But if you use iPhone to review all available, like we pilots should analyze all available sources for the weather for the intended operation. Local destination en route forecast for a period of operations etc so just quick look oh it looks like great sky clear at my destination sky clear at my departure everything is is nice sometimes it's just not enough or maybe sky is clear right now and an hour later the the the, the, the front is coming over and the, the trend of the of that storm movement can be quite obvious when we go through the proper weather briefing for, for, for the operation. In California especially, we are spoiled with the good weather to the most part. And when we fly first time long distance, we are not ready for the kind of weather people are dealing with in, the, in these uh, regions. I can tell that the most um, critical part for my planning for flying to Oshkosh was weather and I looked at it once I looked at it twice just I, I got standard briefing I got the <laughs> briefing I, I got uh, the final look just before I start the engine and I had my uh, in-flight tools available to the most part uh, we will actually talk about in-flight tools and what kind of help they give us and what are shortcomings of those kind of tools um, so for all pilots I uh, recommend going through AC 91 slash 92 which is the pilot guide for pre-flight briefing um, it talks about all aspects what pilots should work on uh, when uh, preparing for the flight um, study learn to to analyze proc, uh, proc charts, uh, what the fronts are doing, um, current conditions, forecasted conditions, uh, what radar looks like, um, what is, what are the trends. So we can see, for example, we animate the radar. We see where the weather is developing, where how it's moving. Uh, is it typical? Is it aligning with the front uh, uh, positioning? How does it look from um, high pressure areas and low pressure areas? Uh, another interesting hint I never actually considered myself because I typically fly relatively low, like without use of oxygen under 12,000 uh, MSL, uh, is different layers of weather. Uh, I forgot what, what the particular chart looks like, but it gives you uh, the weather situation at different altitudes and uh, th this uh, podcast I listened to uh, today was focusing uh, on specific hints you can get from analyzing this different altitude uh, uh, and w 
because the weather on the surface can be significantly different uh, from the weather on top depending if it's a cold front moving in or the warm front moving in the, 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 the winds are doing different things and the temperatures and so on and so forth um, so. Oh, they have the internet on computers now Yeah, that was uh, fr from the presentation. Uh, you can see that tools we have are absolutely amazing. We just need to learn to use them. And if we use these tools every time we, we plan a flight, uh, we build more and more proficiency in analyzing this chart. Uh, there are two great uh, sources be beyond just four flight. Four flight, in my opinion, is a little bit too basic. Um, and it requires more skill going into different areas on for a flight to get the full picture. Uh, the weather, the briefing itself generated by for a flight does not cover every single aspect of, of the weather. But if you go to aviationweather.gov or 1-800-weather-brief, you get a lot more options. You just have to learn how to use these options especially in IFR type of flying. Um, to me, I, I think it makes me most nervous uh, getting my IFR ticket that there is so much more I have to consider comparing to uh, VFR flying. Uh, FAA recently updated the weather reference doc document, uh, um, Aviation Weather Handbook. Uh, it's the, the link to that is on the slides. Um, you'll get the copy, but you can look it up. Um, it's if you use for flight, you can download it and have it uh, on your iPad at all times and get back to it if you forget something. Um, another interesting case study related to the weather. Um, seemed to be like a basic flight, so it was uh, part 91 um, going from America's uh, Georgia, uh, Cirrus uh, SR-22, SR um, very well equipped aircraft. The departure time was uh, 0550 uh, Eastern Daylight Time, 0950 Zulu. The departure time is important actually here. So the pilot was commercially instrument rating, AMP, with a lot of flying experience, over uh, about 22,000 hours. Uh, pilot passenger, 40-year-old um, agriculture pilot, not instrument rated, AMP, pretty good experience too. And both uh, were former avionic instructors at um, uh, Georgia Tech, uh, Tech College. No mechanical malfunctions but not certified for IFR flight. So they didn't have all the check, check boxes uh, completed for IFR flight uh, on that aircraft. So what happened? They were going to uh, Oshkosh Air Venture. That's the airport uh, for departure. Um, VFR conditions over Oshkosh, no flight plan or weather briefing records. Departure was IFR conditions prevailing, so METAR at the time, uh, uh, in effect, um, was showing overcast at uh, uh, what was it, 50, right? So satellite imagery and sounding depicted low stratiform clouds with tops near 2,500 feet. Hermet Sierra current for IFR operations ending way past the departure time and night IMC prevailed. VFR conditions were reported roughly four hours after the intended departure. This is what it looks look like. And this is what the flight path looked like. Radar data indicated the aircraft took off and made a left climbing turn to 1150 before descending with 60 seconds to the ground. So 
the pilot had spe the case of uh, special disorientation. Dis dis so they departed in IMC conditions, the aircraft was not certified for IMC conditions, they did not file a flight plan, they were planning to get on top and fly VFR. Didn't make it. Let's talk about the weather in cockpit. Uh, weather in cockpit is the ability for the pilot to get current weather in route and at the destination uh, to increase situational awareness. Uh, next red provides superior over the horizon look ahead of uh, uh, look ahead capability. It's not designed for initial pre-flight planning. Images are snapshots in time and not real time. The lag of imagery is anywhere from 5 to 20 minutes due to radar volume scans, processing, transmission, etc. Some areas have no radar coverage. So when we fly and we see on our uh, charts that uh, no radar coverage available, that's exactly what it means. We cannot identify embedded thunderstorms typically. We, we can probably see the, the movements and trends, um, but is it safe for us to plan our flight around the weather? So let's see. So you, you, you look at something like this, the storm didn't move, go around, right? So that, that's the purpose of this uh, in-flight instrument, right? If used properly. So let's uh, look at some other examples. So if we want to fly, let's say, from point A to point B, and we see something in our path like that, do we fly across this kind of weather? Is it a good idea? What we can encounter if we do, right? So the current time shown on your iPad um, is a good clue. And we can see what is the time this image was produced. So for example, here the current time is 1541 Zulu and radar image time is actually uh, significantly behind. 11 minutes behind. Do we know tops? Do we know if it's growing or decaying? What would be the best route to avoid? This looks like probably probably a good option. Maybe just scoot to the west and instead of going south. But what if it moves the opposite direction? So. We'll, we see the line of thunderstorms here uh, on the top. I would say the typical movement would be exactly in the direction of intended um, uh, bypass. So keep in mind if you... Which way to head the So the most probable direction of movement is in the front of the red lines. Right. So the tail is in the end of it, which means wind is blowing in this, blowing in this way uh, in a northwesterly direction. It wouldn't be a good idea to fly this way because we will find ourselves right in a pickle if we go this way. <coughs> yeah. Go northeast. Go in the back of a thunderstorm if you want to go around it. That's another bad example. If we fly from point A to point B and we hope this storm will pass by the time we get there, what if it gets stuck and stops and hangs in, in there, although maybe not as intense, but um, still quite bad. So key points here, never intend to penetrate a, a line of uh, thunderstorms. Uh, very likely to experience uh, severe, uh, intense updrafts, downdrafts, and the line of a thunderstorm when you see all this red stuff is 80% severe weather as everything else. And when you see like bow lines of a thunderstorms, uh, it indicates significant uh, gust and microburst activity in the front. So avoid it at all costs land, tie down, hide, 
wait it out it's not gonna be there forever definitely that's one kind of scenario you better be on the ground and feel sorry you are not flying than the other way around because your options are very limited up in the, in the air this is a very uh, strong example why we should avoid lines of thunderstorms so this accident uh, was ifr part 91 corporate flight going from texas to tampa florida the pilot a uh, young gentleman uh, with over 1900 hours the aircraft equipped with airborne uh, x-band weather radar storm scope which detects lightning and XM weather satellite uh, receiver environment obtained uh, weather briefing and anticipated deviating around the weather five people died in route um, pilot advised ATC he has XM weather on board ATC clears him to deviate as necessary ATC broadcast convective SIGMET current in, uh, uh, in route and suggested to tune to HIWAS for more information. The aircraft had a rapid descent through 7,600 feet, overshoot cloud tops over the accident site at flight level, level 4,000, uh, uh, flight level 430. So there is a I think audio here. See these black lines? This is where he is right now. Uh, any chance of a, uh, you give us some uh, direction? accident he was he found himself in this area of red
of a thunderstorm there is probably there was probably pressure from the corporate passenger who was flying with them to get him to Tampa on time for whatever reason the pilot was young bold he, 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 he was very he, in, in the beginning of a conversation with ATC he was very confident and that confidence was gone very fast. I mean, they lost control, the aircraft was break, broken down in flight. They didn't hit the ground. So, convective clouds which look like that is no fun. <laughs> uh, it's not fun even over those kind of clouds. It's a severe turbulence on top and extreme turbulence inside and severe downdraft. All right, well. Study the uh, aeronautical information manual for thunderstorm fl flying. Right there, it says 20 miles or more, right? <laughs> 20 miles or more. <laughs> oh, yeah. we, Don't we get near the, the thunderstorm closer than 20 miles. Even at the edge of 20 miles, you may experience some interesting weather. Yes. Yeah, so in the next few slides, uh, he goes into details on what the color uh, on a radar is telling you. Uh, so light is green. Um, it's, uh, it means reflectivity ranges of 30 decibel. I, for me, it's really not, I cannot tell much. But I can tell you that even if you fly in the green area, you may encounter significant downdrafts if that cloud decided to drop some rain, uh, which will be significant even for, uh, you know, certified J aircraft. The 
larger airplane might not have any issues with it in a in a in a green and yellow zone but we, we flying now Cessnas and whatever else we are flying definitely gonna feel it and we will regret being there <laughs> at the wrong time so different products used by um, ATC uh, have different level of digitalization and I will not go deep into it because I'm not an expert on this for sure but you are welcome to study it and research different sources etc now this picture is very important for us to look at um, specifically cross-section of a square line so who knows what square line is Chris do you know what square line is it's a line of thunderstorms uh, which could be a head of embedded thunderstorm so it's a definitely a nasty <laughs> kind of weather <laughs> definitely stay away from it so what is going on, right? So we have um, the motion of a form of a storm is depicted by the cloud structure. So many people make a wrong assumption seeing this top kind of overhang over the cloud, considering maybe wind is pushing it in that direction. So the cloud kind of spread out. So it's opposite. So the overhang is in the direction of a movement of, th of a thunderstorm. So in, in the area where the thunderstorm is moving, we have warm air inflow going inside, which builds that cloud movement, right? So there is updraft on the front side of it. And there is a inflow of dry air from the back of it that creates the condition for severe downdraft in the middle. So, so when you get a strong updraft, you've got tail coming out the top, and the wind blows the layers away. Right. So a lot of interesting stuff happening there. Now, this is what it looks like in developing uh, situation. See what's going on there? Very light intensity echoes, typically under 20 decibel, associated with outflow boundary or uh, fine line, not detectable on airborne or ATC radar. So here is what's actually going on here. So there is a gust front at the leading edge cool air rushing down and out of a thunderstorm and this stuff is pretty far away from the epicenter of the thunderstorm and could be even farther than 20 miles so we can ha have effects of a thunderstorms way outside of those 20 miles radius so it all depends on severity So this is a mathematical model showing uh, the gas front with cold air outflow and warm air overriding it. So there is a wave-like condition forming on the boundary surface and definitely poses the extreme conditions to the aircraft. But you also have a circular motion at the top. So it's riding over it and it pushes it back down even though it's moving at the same time. Right. Do not land or take off in the face of an approaching thunderstorm. You may not have time to tie it down like the pilot in um, Florida had experience. They landed right before it came, but uh, they didn't make it. Another. You have to be careful. It depends on what airport you're working out of. Chicago wants to get you in and out. Like there's an MD-80. Good weather radar in it. And the taxi, taxi is positioned in the hole, and I think as we started to move, I told him to talk to us, get the radar on, and see what we got. It ended up being this way. They cleared for takeoff, and they said, we just held up the wind. He said, stand by. They said, clear for takeoff. He's trying to get everybody out of there. I said, we're not taking off in this truck, so we need to clear the runway. Now, now Chicago's clear. 
And then he clears as we start to move off the runway, we have to hold because we've got a line of airplanes flying in front of the sort of the airport. So I have to control, I'm going to have to control runway to, to, to bypass that. Stealth. See, now I just taxi out and we <laughs> clear for takeoff. <laughs> no, we want to follow America. <laughs> and then the whole, everything just came to effect. Okay, everybody hold their position. But I wouldn't do it. Five miles from the end of the runway, and you're taking off into a Vegeta area with the severe weather. I said, no way. No way. I'm just getting paid by the minute. I'm not getting paid to go to <laughs> kill myself. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So you have to be careful. Some people are aggressive and, and will do it. But uh, again, you have to see that you're at a, a large airport with a lot of traffic, a lot of cold air. Uh, they'll try and get you out. Once you say, Roger, you got the power to it, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. and, and so you got to protect yourself. Yeah. And now you're working out of airports with very little weather radar uh, or non powered airports. You're trying to make your own decisions. You got to be cautious. Especially these little Kodak airports that come right over town. You got these bells that. So this incident uh, is stressing the importance of the current weather uh, at disposal of a pilot. And so pilot was single engine land, instrument rated, 1850 hours, departing um, Rantoul, uh, Illinois, going to Sarasota, Florida. He obtained weather uh, briefing and filed IFR plan about 19 hours before estimated time of departure. He never got abbreviated briefing right before. And the witnesses uh, stated he was in a hurry to beat the weather front moving through the area. Anything rings a bell? <laughs> front, he, he knew there is a front moving through the area. But he wasn't aware how close that front is and how fast it's moving. But it's yeah, Probably his weather true. knowledge like was absolutely weather. out of... So, the pilot arrived at FBO at 8.45 a.m., loaded baggage, pre-flighted aircraft, topped off fuel. When his wife went to restroom, he replied, hurry, because the storm front was coming. As aircraft departed, winds picked up uh, 320, 17, gusting 32. So, the front was already there. And the aircraft departed runway 27, turned south, <coughs> gear up, about 500 feet, appeared the weather pushed tail up, nose down, aircraft went straight down, impacted and burst into flames. Rain did not start until after the accident. So it was immediately in the front action. So the strong winds, gusty winds, are indicators of a front movement in many cases and even though front moves in a specific speed and in a specific direction it can change abruptly so it can suddenly stop or reverse the, the, the motion and it's not possible to control the aircraft in those situations you see the other the gust of 32 you already know there's something strange coming yeah and you didn't analyze that gust nope he was too concerned to depart and hopefully get out and he was literally trying to beat the weather and the weather this is what it looked like from surface analysis point of view this is significance of what who can tell what that is those red lines and two dots That's what it looks in the higher picture. Quail lines, no? And the front movement uh, essentially depicted by that ball, it shows where the front is moving and it's right in the path of that airport. And it says like the SPLS. Yeah. I think it was pulled up the weather within the last hour that was pretty warning. Yeah, that's what it looked like when he was trying to beat the weather. And that uh, passenger's iPhone picture 
showing approaching shelf cloud while the husband was refueling. Right. Just, just looking there, I wouldn't depart. <laughs> it's already nasty. <laughs> just looking outside. If it looks bad, it's going to be bad. So some pictures I have taken uh, when I landed, uh, I, I, I waited out the storm which, going, which was going over the Oshkosh, and I, I, I landed in a good weather. And I took a fuel, but I see the weather is developing and it's moving from the east right across the area. And the, all the radar imagery was confirming that. So a lot of pilots uh, refueled and they were rushing to, to get to the to Oshkosh. Like, why? It was, it was a circus. Nobody got hurt. Nobody got killed. People made it somehow. But they, they got themselves in, ext in, in already extreme conditions going through fisk arrival and added weather front going through that fisk arrival uh, queue. I mean, what, what are you trying to gain? You want to make this $35 you prepaid for your parking work or what? Like, why? I was the only pilot who stayed at that airport. The weather went north of that airport. We only had a little bit of a heavy rain, a little bit of a gust as front passed through, but I was tied down. I was in a, <laughs> in a dry environment. I didn't really regret that my decision. And it looked a lot like that, uh, as you see on the picture. And this is what it looked on the radar. So that strong wind pushing pushing that outer boundary, the square, square lines right here. Uh, why? Wait it out. It would take just a couple of hours for the weather to clear and you'll be out on your way. Nothing is in, in front of you. Get the updated weather and go. So pilot could not maintain airplane control with approaching thunderstorms and it what contributed to this accident is his decision to depart into adverse weather conditions it's with his with his experience it's, it's really unimaginable um, another incident um, going from uh, Plainview Texas to San Antonio Fire IFR plan received for flight weather briefing on takeoff at 2115 central time, immediately lost control and impacted terrain. The line of thunderstorm was approaching from the west. The people lost. Same exact problem as previous uh, scenario. And this is what the weather looked like. Um, so, wind 326 gusting 36, rains, um, and why? Lightning in this uh, in, in distance, right? Thunderstorm activity in, uh, southwest and through northwest. Why, why going in those kind of conditions? Uh, what, what he was trying to prove? I got him to fly into there when I took left at 27. Sure. There is no, there was nothing left from the aircraft. Again, same symbol, looks familiar. Line of thunderstorm and it's bold in this direction, so it's clearly showing the movement. And that's where the accident was. And that's what it looks on the imagery. So it's nasty. And if the pilot simply got the current briefing, if he didn't look outside the window, he probably wouldn't fly. No, no, no reason.
And the downdrafts not only straight, straight vertical, the downdrafts typically have a twist to it. So it's never just pushing you down, it's going to screw you into the ground. Pilot decision to take off ahead of an approaching severe severe thunderstorm, and he lost control, and that's it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, look at that weather. You see the line of rolling clouds. You see extremely dark under them, and you typically get gusting winds picking up way ahead of a moving thunderstorm. So I used to live in New York and the thunderstorm was normal through the whole summer period. I wasn't flying at the time, but I, you, you, you see the winds picking up, uh, get cover. <laughs> Some nasty weather is coming. Right, so the closing remarks. Obtain a pre-flight weather briefing before the departure. Get regular updates while en route. If encountered conditions worse than expected, make command decision. Alter the plan, divert, turn back, wait it out, take a break, avoid convection at least by 20 miles. Don't hesitate to utilize ATC resources and don't hesitate to say unable if ATC gives you uh, instructions which are not in your capacity to fulfill. I had this experience actually going my second leg en uh, route to Oshkosh there was a thunderstorm uh, on my path and ATC told me divert to this VOR it will take you around so I look at the path I started flying that initially I look at the path it's a rising terrain and the imagery trend shows that it will get right on top of me I'm like unable I'll go north uh, west instead. He's like, oh yeah, sure, you can, you can find more than one path around this storm. Okay, <laughs> uh, I feel good about it after I actually saw what was going on on on, on the path which uh, I didn't take. So utilize ATC resources, but keep in mind they are serving us pilots to begin with. We are not serving them. If unable, don't do it. Do something else which is safe for you and your passengers. Remember that there is a time lag in the next right Im Im images. Whatever product you get in flight, it's delayed. Uh, it may be irrelevant by the time you'll be in a certain area. Be aware of landing and take off with approaching thunderstorms of a frontal wave, which may ruin your day in no time. Uh, keep in mind that uh, front gusts are not displayed on uh, onboard um, uh, product. Uh, report encountered weather. If you see something which is not on your radar uh, or on your weather product, report it to ATC. It, will, it, it may help a pilot uh, who, who is there. And stay current. Fly often and fly safe. And I'll be more than happy to share this presentation on my on our team's channel. Um, and if you have any questions, if you'd like to explore specific aspects of weather flying, we can dedicate to that additional uh, session in the future. Questions? Online audience, any questions? Well... If no questions, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much for being present. Um, we have Maria Rodriguez and Harper and Luke Sinstra. Do we have anyone on YouTube? Okay, so we'll make sure we'll uh, log you.